How Eddie did Eddie Pratt? Eddie yeah. Pratt was working for me, and he just I hired him from MC Anderson right. because Thrapp in the good days right at the end he worked for me at Childress's. Now you and he were pretty good friends, yeah, correct? We were good friends. Okay. You know, yeah. he and Jim Smith, you know, they run the ultra race team and you know, a lot of people don't know it, but later on down the road, I went to work for Jim Smith over there just putting the engineering stuff together and making sure that I was at Smith's insurance policy is what he called me. <laughs> he said, yeah, when there's something's wrong, I call Brewer. Brewer yeah. straightens it out. Yeah. And that's what I did. But me and Thrapp, you know, we were we were tight. You know, we lived, he rode to work with me every morning, you know, back and forth. And, you know, we were brothers, so to speak. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, but he came to me. He said, hey, uh, you ever thought about cutting back on the schedule? I said, dude, just won a championship with Daryl. He said, yeah. And he called him up with Didi. He said, I love him too. But he said, you know, if you're looking to get out, he said, I know a man pay you a lot of money. Really? How much money are you talking about? And he told me, I went, really? So, you know, Harold said, hey, we're just trading time for money. I said, well, we might as well get some more money for our time. But Hammond, he was with me for a long time. And uh, Jeff, he's, he's a good fabricator and, you know, but he had admirations of being a crew chief too. But he, uh, he kind of let the cat out of the bag and he called Harold Johnson and said, well, Brewer and Harold, they, they thinking about leaving. And I was at John Mars Christmas party over in Winston-Salem and I come in the next morning and, and Junior, Brewer, get up here. And I'm telling you, he had the big old brew guns on. He was sitting behind that desk. And me and Harold, we walked in the door. We'd been out partying about half the night. <laughs> and he was hitting that desk with his foot. Yeah. You could tell he was madder than hell. And I hear you boys might be going somewhere. Well, I got an offer to go. I didn't say it was, but I said, I got an offer to go somewhere. I said, pretty good offer. Well, I ain't paying you that much money. Okay, whatever you want to do, it's your call. Ain't mine. And, you know, the conversation should have went a lot further, but I was young and yeah. And Junior had been your best man, is that correct? He was my best man at my wedding. Yeah, yeah. Judy K. Childress was Susan's maid of honor. You know, I I I'll tell you point blank, I done things for Junior Johnson. They put my ass in penitentiary for. <laughs> you know, I mean, do tell. It's, it's simple, <laughs> you know, but but. Hey, there was a lot of tradition at Junior Johnson Associates. Yeah. A lot of tradition. And just like when I started, I knew what the tradition was. I know what the expectations were. I wasn't going to be the downfall. Yeah. I might be the bad guy, but I ain't going to be the downfall. And I fought everybody there at one time or another. <laughs> everybody there. If it's good for the crew chief, nah. Good for the driver? No. Nah. Good for the owner? No. Nah. Good for the engine builder? No. Nah. Good for the fabricators? No. Nah. If it ain't good for everybody, don't even ask me about it because I damn sure ain't going to do it. Yeah. You know, that's just the way it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they needed a doctor, i get them a doctor. They need a lawyer, i get them a lawyer. They need a loan at the bank, i call Paul Holbrook. And Paul Albrook told me many times, he said, Brewer, you got to be out of your mind. I wouldn't loan that guy a quarter. <laughs> okay, Ben, you got that off your chest now. You going to give him the money or not? Well, I'll loan you the money and you can give it to him. That's fine. I don't care as long as it gets done, Paul. But, Rick, you take care of your people. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I'll say this. I wouldn't have said it in 1981, but I'll say it today. That was the biggest mistake I made in my career. Really? Leaving in 1981. Because Daryl and I got an opportunity, <laughs> and that's a great story. Uh, Bruton Smith is a good friend of mine. And when Bruton asked, calls me and asks me to do something, I do it. I'll never send him a bill. Because when I call him and tell him I need this or that, you know, that's just the way it's done. When I had my ESPN tech garage and I had my big trailer and all my cutaway cars and all that stuff, I had my motor coach and I got a nice, nice generator. And Bruton always let me park down behind the hospital on the pavement. And it's all good. Well, they called me and said, hey Bruce, we got about 
750 people over here, we're going to feed breakfast. We need somebody to come over here and entertain them. Okay, ain't no problem. I'll do that. And it had been raining, nasty, and muddy. And I'm going, okay. Well, I seen Marcus, the whole car coming through. About that time, I looked over, and this guy's over here doing like this. And it's Daryl. And he's flagging Marcus down. <laughs> I'm thinking, boy, this ain't going to be too good. Anyway, I hear him out here doing this, and he's pointing over there. And I'm going, hmm, wonder what he's talking about. Anyway, I think nothing more about it. He wants so, your spot. <laughs> so he, so he, he pulled, Marcus pulls in, I get in the car. I say, hey, what Daryl want? He said, I oh, just a little upset. I said, yeah, what the hell he's upset about? He said, well, he said, had some gravel and some mud over there, and, you know, it wasn't exactly what he wanted. And he said, I've won a lot of races here, and I've done this, and I've done that. And he said, yeah, but that guy over there, he's – my dad told me I had to always take care of that guy. He said, because him and my dad are really good friends. He said, well, I've won a lot of races. I've done a lot of stuff over here. He said, well, who is that guy? He said, that's Tim Brewer. <laughs> really? Guess who I had to do the breakfast with? <laughs> Daryl. <laughs> and we're sitting there talking, and he's still <laughs> – like old Banny Rooster, and I'm sitting there going, yeah, well, what would it? He said, yeah, would have, could have, should I said, yeah, you're a good one to talk. I said, you're the guy that sent me $750 for a Christmas bonus after winning a championship for you in 1981. I said, dude, I picked up bigger bar bills for you than that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, at the end of the day, he knows and I know. Had we have stayed together, yeah. and Hammond done him a good job, but Hammond didn't do the job I'd have done for him. It's like Mike Hill said, "Bro, when you left, they hired me and Doug and Hammond." And he said it wasn't no way to screw this deal up because you had fourteen race cars sitting there, had springs and shock absorbers on them. He said, "Couldn't nobody mess this deal up." But at the end of the day, they won it in '82. Uh, they should have won it in 83, but Bobby won it. 84, who knows what happens. 85, that's a good one. I'll tell you the, the straw that broke the camel's back. We go down to MC Anderson's, and we're doing our deal down there in 1982. And Kale, he ain't lost nothing. I mean, he, he ain't missed a beat. We go to Daytona, we went 125-mile run. I don't know, second or third in a, in a Bush Clash. Finished second in the Daytona 500. That's when the back bumper flew off of Bobby Allison's car. <laughs> oh, excuse me, held on by two eighth-inch pop rivets on each end. <laughs> that thing went across the roof of my car and cut a gouge in it about like that. Kale says, there's a hole in the roof. Right damn bumper like to hit it. Come off Bobby's car. It wound up in Joe Milliken's grill. But anyway, we run second. Well, that was just an accident. Oh, sure it was. <laughs> if I had known that bumper was like that, and they tested with a bumper off the yep, car. Yeah, yeah. I'd have went up and kicked that damn thing about it. When they said, gentlemen, start your engine, I just went up there and kicked the damn thing and knocked it off. But anyway, long story short, we go to Atlanta, run second. Yeah. Go to Darlington. And MC, he said, I just, I just want my car to be up front. Well, Kale got spun at Darlington. And, hey, we don't know how to quit. We ain't smart enough to know how to quit. So we patch it up and put it back out there. Run second at Darlington. Okay, that's going pretty good. I think we won four races that year and uh, had combustion chamber fall out of the cylinder head, cast iron cylinder heads, blew motor up. But anyway, we won four. Went back to the Southern 500. Blew up qualifying because we were trying to get the motor down low. It broke a oil fitting off in the oil pump, sucked a bunch of air up, blew the motor up. Harold went back to Savannah, rebuilt the motor, brought it back up there. We won Kale Yarborough's fifth Southern 500. Our average finish that year at Darlington was 1.5. Yeah. We won one and finished second in the other one. So it was great. But, uh, I got the shock of my life after getting home from Darlington and went back to Savannah and uh, MC says, Brewer, I need you to look up here for a minute. Okay. Rick, I just bought me a lot on Intercoastal. 
cheap lot, told him, I said, hey, I need to borrow a dump truck and a front end loader and stuff like that, fix my lot. He says, you go back there and work on that race car. I'll fix that lot for you. I said, okay. I said, I can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Susan and I, we just built us a, a beautiful home. And uh, Henry Walters was a, Waters was a guy's name that overseen it for me. He's about 75 years old. And I mean, he was a fabulous builder. Him and his son, H.L. Waters. But anyway, long story short, when I'll go up there and sit in front of MC, he's got them glasses pulled down on the end of that nose. And I'm going, what the hell did I do wrong? Just want a Southern 500, yeah? And it's like, bro, I made a decision. What'd you make a decision about? He said, Kale turned me down. What Kale turned you down for, MC? He said, I want to pay him to run for a championship. He don't want to do that. I said, MC, I don't want to run for a championship. Kale don't want to run for a championship. We come down here to do less work, spend more time with our families, and have a good time. He said, well, Wayne Estes was a writer down there. Yeah. Well, he put it in the paper that MC said if he, Kale wouldn't run for the championship for him, he was going to quit. He said, Brewer, my word's my bond around the Savannah. And he said, means a lot to me. So he said, Kale ain't going to run for me. He said, I'm going to quit racing. What the hell you mean you're going to quit racing? He said, I'm going to pay you and Harold everything, your contracts and all that stuff, but I'm quitting racing. That ain't the point, dude. What are you going to quit racing for? Yeah. I said, Kale's just going to go somewhere else and drive part-time. I said, hey, everybody moved their stuff down here. I built a new house. Dude, what Wayne Estes wrote in that paper ain't worth a crack bottle of whatever. I said, dude, there ain't nobody going to hold you to that. Dude, you don't need to do this. I made up my mind. Okay. So, you know, we, we went to Rockingham with the Valvoline car the fall of that year, set a new world record with a Unical pit crew competition with the Vabilene car. Yeah. And Bill Gasway <laughs> turns over and looks at them guys and goes, they can't do that. And I'll never forget, <laughs> some guy standing behind him said, can't do it hell, they just did. <laughs> 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 and me and LG DeWitt and a bunch of us, uh, you know, we went to Vegas and went to Caesars and done all that stuff and all that stuff as a guest of Unical. And Dick Dolan and all them guys, they were, they were fabulous to us. But uh, anyway, at the end of the year, it's like MC told me and Harold, he said, I'll just sell you all the equipment. I said, dude, I just started making some pretty good money. I ain't gonna spend it all on a race car. You know, but at the end of the day, a guy named Raymond Beadle. Raymond the Beadle. Blue, the Blue Max. He'd always come to Junior's and Beadle, he'd be with old sunglasses on top of his head and long hair and leather cha leather jacket on. He'd come walking through there and have him old cowboy boots on. And I mean, he's like pigeon-toed and walking and Trump stumbling over stuff. I'm going, who in the hell is that? Oh, it's Beadle, you know, ain't no yeah. big deal. And he, and it's one of them deals, he goes, Brewer, uh, you want to you wanna run a race team? Dude, I run race teams my whole life. That's, you know, it's like nothing. And another guy was interested in it. The guy's name was Hal Needham. And Needham flew to Savannah, <laughs> and I'll never forget it. <laughs> he was sitting on an airplane, and about the time they started to drop the nose and come in there, he goes, what is that smell? <laughs> and he asked me, he said, Brewer, what is that smell around here? I said, that's the smell of money. <laughs> that's bag air over there. I said, that's the pulp wood place over yeah, there. Yeah, he yeah. said, man, this place sure does stink. I said, yeah, it sure does. But anyway, you ain't going to keep the race team here if you buy this thing, are you? He said, nah, bro, we're going to move it somewhere else. Okay. So I got Raymond Beadle and I got Hal Needham. And of course, Tim Richmond, they're both lobbying him. Hal Needham loved Richmond. Yeah. And me and Richmond, we'd, we'd done pretty good. And, you know, that's as far as friends and goofing off and whatever. It was all good. So at the end of the day, I told I told MC, I said, look, me and Harold, we're not gonna buy this thing. You just need to sell it or whatever. He said, okay. So it come down, Raymond Beadle. He come down and he said, bro, I'm gonna buy this place. Okay. 
he said, can I talk to you and Harold? Yeah, sure, ain't no problem. So anyway, about that time, uh, unfortunately, I met Joel Houtner one time. Yeah. He had bought an old place that the Blue Max building was in and up from Ron Osterlin and stuff like that. And he had Pearson running out of it. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something. Joel Houtner would have been in the business. He would have been a successful guy because his family built the World Trade Center. He had bukus of money. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. His family built the World Trade Center. Wow. And he was, he was at his offshore boat deal, and something happened to the throttle guy. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, well, you know, I'll do it. And the boat came over, and that was the end of Joel Hauptner, and that was the end of Pearson, you know, at that time. But Beetle says, hey, I, I can go up there and buy that place up there. Okay. So, you know, we moved it from Savannah, and we, you know, started Blue Max down there. And I'll never forget Rod Osterlin, you know, and J.D. Stacy. <laughs> That's when Booby Harrington was running a deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Raymond comes up there one time, and he goes, hey, you want to buy some of that equipment down there? Yeah, sure. And I went down there, and I'm trying to eat my lunch and drink a soda, and, you know, I'm going, yeah, I'd like to have that. Well, Robert wants to keep that, J.D. Stacy. I, did, I didn't trust him no further than I could throw it. Anyway, well, I'll buy that. Well, Robert wants to keep that. I said, who the hell is Robert anyway? Robert. I said, you mean Booby, right? <laughs> he goes, yeah, Booby wants, Robert wants yeah, to keep yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got a question. Beetle come up here and said, hey, Brewer, come on down here and pick out the stuff you want to buy. Now, I've told you I want to buy that, that, and that. You want to sell the damn stuff or not? Because I'm going to go back up here and eat my lunch. I got a car sitting on the service plate. I got to get ready to go. I'll see you guys. Anyway, I left. I mean, I don't like to deal with people that talk out of both sides of the mouth. Yeah. You know what I mean? And J.D. Stacy. He had crook wrote all over him. But, I mean, at the end of the day, we took Tim Richmond and um, started off. I had old Slick posting over there helping me, and Slick, he's as good as gold. And uh, we started Blue Max Racing, and uh, Larry McReynolds was my truck driver. Yeah. You know, uh, little Joe Cudmore, he was over there working. Banjo Grimm. I had a lot of, a lot of young guys. Uh, Raymond Fox. The second, he was over there working with Harold in the motor room. Had a bunch of guys over there that, you know, they were pretty good. The Allman brothers, they were there. And uh, we started Blue Mike's Racing. And the, the, the beauty of that was we strolled into Old Milwaukee's headquarters at that time in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, at the end of the day, we left her with a check for $2.5 million. <laughs> and Raymond B. That was a... That, that was a a stretch there now. Yeah. That was to sponsor the old Milwaukee Pontiac with Tim Richmond, Sammy Swindell in the Sprint cars, and Raymond Beetle in the Slits Blue Max car. So it was a pretty good deal. Yeah. But Beetle, he had Chaparral trailers down there, and you know, I've got pictures at my house and on my phone of, you know, the Blue Max rig we had and the Blue Max Pontiac and Old Milwaukee and all that stuff. And it was a class act. And you know, Raymond had a big following. I mean, Bob Seeger was a big fan. We used to go hang out with Seeger backstage. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, it was big. And, you know, Reggie Jackson, he'd come and, you know, hang out. And, you know, I got baseball, Reggie, and all that stuff. But, you know, it's, Raymond had a big following. And D. Gant and Fred Miller and Dale Armstrong and all those guys, you know, they were super people. But I, I knew Bernstein and Perdome and all those guys. And, Rick, it was funny. That Blue Max complex, we had tons of square footage inside and when they'd come to Rockingham, going to Atlanta or something like that, they'd all come out there and i walk out in the back of the building and go, what the hell are y'all guys doing? Oh, bro, we're used to working on the, on the pavement. I said, well, there's concrete floors in here. There's, you know, a nice air-conditioned yeah. shop, heated shop, yeah. and this, that, and other. Oh, we're, we'd like to be out here. But, you know, those guys, they were in a different world. But, I mean, it was between Sammy Swindell and Tim Richmond and Raymond Beetle. I mean, those were the stars. And I mean, Sammy Swindell, I'll never forget, we carried him to Daytona in a, in a Bush car. And <laughs> Sammy went out and run that thing. 
didn't run as good as I thought it needed to. And uh, Sammy said, Brewer said, this, this thing's a little bit strange. What do you mean strange, Sammy? He said, being sideways at 120 mile an hour is a lot different than being sideways at 180 mile an hour. <laughs> I said, Sammy, that ain't no big deal. I said, I'll tell you what to do. I said, just to check myself, how about we let Slim take it for a spin? Oh, that'd be good. Now I called Tim Richmond, I called him Slim. Hey, psst, hit it. Okay. He go out and run about five or six laps, come back in and said, what do you say is wrong with it? I said, I said, it's a little bit loose, a little sideways. He said, ah, hell, it's fine. Don't worry about it, Brewer. Just leave it alone. He, he'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> but Sammy, yeah. I mean, Sammy Swindell and Amy, I mean, salt to the earth. Sammy wouldn't say, he wouldn't say nothing if he had a mouthful. But when you put him in that sprint car, I'm telling you, he was the man. Yeah. But, I mean, so I got to see – I got to see Swindell do that, and Raymond Beadle. He's got to be he, – he was around at Nitro way too long. <laughs> <laughs> Beadle, he'd be – we'd go to Darlington, and he'd be right down the road from the racetrack. He'd be sitting in that thing, and, you know, they're getting ready to stage, and he's going, hey, Brewer, how you doing? You goofy. <laughs> you better be looking at where you're going. And I'll never forget, he, he made one run, and he went down through there. And that thing bottomed out on the headers on one side, and that thing jumped up. And, you know, he, he got out of it and shut it down. But he come back to the garage here. I said, damn, B, that's kind of close, wasn't it? He said, bro, when it gets quiet, it's getting real close. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that that team eventually wound up having some financial trouble, and I actually heard that you were writing checks out of your personal account. You heard right. We went to Darlington, spring, yeah. 1983. Yeah. Thurman Huggins and I have been friends for years. But I send the guys down and get some tires. And guy come back, he said, Thurman said he wasn't right. He wasn't, he wasn't taking no more bad checks. He said he is not mounting no more damn tires. I said, I went down there, I said, Thurman. He said, Brewer, it owes me like $25,000. Okay, not a problem. Will you mount me the tires? If you give me a check for $25,000, okay, Thurman. And I always carry a check in my pocket. And my household account, there's $25,000. <laughs> he goes, you going to get your money back? I said, you can believe I'm going to get my money back. <laughs> I said, there ain't no doubt in my yeah, mind because yeah, if I yeah. don't, Susan will kill me. But anyway, long story short, the payroll, I, I'm in pretty good standings back in the day at First Union. But when a lady calls me at the bank and says, Mr. Brewer, we've had several of these payroll checks bounce. Really? I just said, hey, babe, tell you what you do. You put the payroll checks up against my savings account until I get this stuff straightened out. Okay, Mr. Brewer, we can do that. Okay, because I got people coming in there in my office going, Brewer, Hell. My, <laughs> my, my paycheck bounced. Yeah, we'll carry it back down there. Well, it's going to bounce. I said, no, it won't bounce this time. But anyway, long story short, here comes Beetle in. We sat on a pole with Tim Richmond at Darlington. Yeah, yeah. And Beetle comes up there and he goes, oh, it's just a little misunderstanding. I said, misunderstanding? I said, let me tell you something, Hoss. In NASCAR, you pay your damn bills. I said, when I call somebody and say, hey, psst, I want tires, I get tires. When I call somebody and say, hey, look, I want connecting rods, I get connect, I get valves, I get whatever I want. Because I pay my bills. At Junior Johnson Associates, if it didn't have T-I-B on it, it didn't get paid. Junior said, you sign every invoice that comes through here and that way we know we ain't nobody robbing us. Okay. And Carol Bird was my... A TIB, your initials? Yeah, Timothy Ivan Brewer. Okay. It, if it ain't got TIB on it, it ain't getting paid. I said, okay, not a problem. And, I, and I've done stuff like that my whole life. But, I mean, at the end of the day, we sat on the pole with Richmond. And, God, that was, that was a disaster. He goes down and... They dropped the green flag, and he goes down in the corner like a bat out of hell, and he come off turn two, 
and there ain't nobody in sight. He done checked out on him. He left it in third gear. <laughs> Kaboom. <laughs> he blew that motor all to hell off the turn two. And he's he's up in the groove on and the he first pulls lap. down. He pulls down <laughs> and then he goes, Oh, this can't be happening to me. And he pulls back up and hell, he took Terry Labonte out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, took a, he took a boatload of them out, and I'm going, what in the hell now? You know, but it's just, it's one of those growing things. And and I go, hey, man, I know what happened. Well, I don't know what happened to it. I said, I know what happened to it. They must have been turning 12,000 when it come off the corner over there, and it, boom. And, but I told him, I said, Slim, forget it. You know, but that was my, my good little... That's when I had that Pontiac Le Mans, and I got my butt chewed out from Pontiac left, right, and center, and Raymond Beetle and everybody else because they had that big old Pontiac Grand Prix, and it was a brick. That was the biggest piece of junk race car I've ever seen in my life. So I built Richmond of Le Mans, and you couldn't have put him in any better race car because Dorsey Patrick used to stand up on the trailers and shoot the pictures because I said, hey, go down the corner and shoot pictures from my car down. And Rick, it's just like Richmond wanted it. He won't go on the corner, 200 mile an hour, turn in the middle and come off. And you you look at that yellow line around the bottom of the racetrack, that white line, left front tire would be right on that line, left rear wheel be about 18 inches up. <laughs> and that thing would be turning, yeah, he'd yeah, be going, yeah. and it's like, okay. And we come to Charlotte Motor Speedway, same deal. Richmond, he's pretty good there. And uh, right before qualifying, made the bonsai run. Well, I'm sitting there, and that's when they had the the press deal right down there. And you used to look right down through there, and you could see the car in the middle of the corner. And I seen Richmond come through there, and he's like this. I just cut the stopwatches off. Harold said, well, what'd you cut the watches off for? I said, hell, he done wrecked. <laughs> no, no. And anyway, he turned it down pit road, come down there, and uh, pulled the window net down. I said, what happened down there? He said, it wouldn't turn. Well, what'd you do? Well, I turned it with a throttle. <laughs> really? This ain't no damn sprint car, Hoss. It don't weigh 1,500 pounds. You ain't gonna turn it with a throttle. Well, I just jumped out of it and jumped back in it, and it, you know, it turned. Yeah, uh-huh. Good luck with that. Anyway, we sat on the pole, and uh, that was gonna be a really good race until they put up $100,000 for the guy that led the race the most times. We, we lacked that much getting that hundred grand. But the last pit stop, there was a little bit of uh, something going on there that shouldn't have been because the car that won the race had four left side tires on it and a 388 cubic inch motor in it. Oh, that'd be the king. Sorry about that, king. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm standing there and Maurice Petty, love him to death. He backed up against the wall and put his foot up against the wall, and he told Gasway, he said, I claim 388 cubic inches right now. And Gasway said, Chief, there ain't no way it could be that. He said, Gasway, I built the damn motor. I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and and they had them tires, an old Corey Witt. It had his, had his writing on them. Yeah. Good you're mounting them for. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like, oh, well, we're going to take the left side over here. No, they marked it right rear, mounted it, right front, mounted it. And I'm going, okay. We ran third with, with Tim Richmond. Daryl's there. And I told Gasway, I said, hey, tear my car down. Disqualify them two idiots. And, you know, it's 100 grand up. But the, the thing there was, before the race, you know, they said, we're going to pay $15,000, $25,000, whatever it was, and we're going to give somebody a brand-new T-Bird that wins the pole. <laughs> I'm going, okay. And anyway, Harold Elliott and I, we're in. We get 50% of all the qualifying money, period. And Beetle, he's going, oh, I don't care about no qualifying money. You guys can have it all. Okay, that's fine. Hey, we'll take it all. <laughs> Richmond told me, he said, i got to have some of my qualifying money. Well, me and Harold done cut the money up. He said, that damn car's got 8,000 miles on it, 8,300 miles on it. It's got cigarette burns in the seats. I said, guess what? He said, what? I said, you get to 8,300 miles, you get damn cigarette burns in the seat too because me and Harold don't want that car. <laughs> but that's the way we rolled all the time. I mean, me and Harold, well, we, <laughs> he said, NASCAR insurance. 
He said, Brewer, it's a joke. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you read that policy? I said, man, I ain't read that policy in 20 years. I said, used to. You know, if you got killed, they gave you $7,500. If you lost something, you know, Harold said, yeah, if you lost an arm or a leg, they'd try to help you find it. <laughs> but, oh, man, we used to laugh and cut up all the time. But, you know, Bill France Jr., he told me one time, he said, I'm going to give you the stage to perform on and see how you do with it. He said, you know, everybody gets on me about don't pay this and don't pay that. He said, I ain't paying you guys to do nothing. He said, I've given you a stage to perform on. And he did. So, you know, that's all well and good. But at the end of that Tim Richmond era, it was, it was bittersweet. But what got me back in the good graces? Of Bud Junior? At, no, uh, Budweiser and Junior. Okay. We strolled in there. When, when you got Neil Bonnet sitting in that 12 car and you got Darrell Waltrip sitting in that number 11 car and they're the mighty Budweiser cars, we strolled into North Wilkesboro Speedway with Tim Richmond and an old Milwaukee Pontiac and kicked Junior Johnson's ass right in his backyard. <laughs> gotcha. And, so that's and, how that came oh, about. <laughs> and, and it's like, he did what? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, back at that time, I'd had a couple of issues and, like anything else, you know, we came back and and we're leading a race in Riverside, California. And I swear to God, we were out there in the trailer and Billy Bones, he owned a bunch of Western steer restaurants out there in California and Raymond Beetle and here Reggie Jackson comes in and goes, hey man, I got wine up here. I said, hey, that's my wine and it's going to the house. You ain't getting in that. Drink the beer, you know? I just want some wine. I don't give a damn, Reggie. Just drink some beer, you know? <laughs> but anyway, we're eating and the stuff. Well, they beat on the side of the truck and said, hey, all drivers back to your cars. Hell, man, it's still raining out here. What the hell, you lost your mind or what? All drivers back to the car. We're leading the race with Richmond. Huh, great. Anyway, we go back out there. Typical deal. Drive off in turn nine. Raining. Darrell Walter clips Richmond. We lose the race. Well, Bill Elliott won the race. Okay, that's all great. And we're all good. I mean, you know, hey, we understand them guys. They were going for the win. They wrecked. Well, it just so happened when Tim came in the pit area, Jeff Hammond rushed over like he's going to kick my side of the race car. That went over like a damn lead balloon. Pete Peterson, which was my right-hand man, Pete's one of those guys, he's the baddest of the bad, and he's, he's seen more hell than we can ever. The, the whole thing there was, Pete Peterson wrenched over me, and he grabbed Hammond by the throat. And we getting ready to go to war now. And he put him up against that building. And here comes Joe Gasway. And Joe said, hey, y'all can't be fighting in the garage area. And that's when I grabbed hold of Joe. I said, you better get your ass back over there if you don't want to get your ass whipped because we're getting ready to open up a can on these guys. And uh, then that Daryl come over, hey, let him alone, let him alone. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah, whatever. But I mean. This was Riverside. Riverside. Okay. But at the end of the day, we didn't start the fight. You know, Hammond, he's the one that started to kick the race car and that wasn't going to float with me, Pete, and nobody else, you know, because it was going to be a war right then. But I mean, at the end of the day, it was all said and done. And, you know, we're sitting out there in that truck, we're playing cards. And I think a couple guys had cold beers open and this, that, and that. I don't care, you know, because hey, race is over with. Raymond said, well, if I stay here tomorrow and run that race, you know, I said, well, you can call a race tomorrow. He said, why? I said, dude, I leave in the morning. I'm flying from Ontario to San Francisco. Me and Susan and uh, and John Morrow, Karen Morrow, and Hank Eanes and Marilyn Eanes, we're going to Hawaii. <laughs> well, well, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, well, yeah. you know it now. <laughs> so we all went to Honolulu, Hawaii, and went to Maui and went over and hung out. Phil Parsons, he got married. Anyway, he's coming down a slide over there. 
hits his head. Marsh has got to take him, get him sewed up. <laughs> and David Hasselhoff, he's over there, and he's the night rider and all that stuff. And all the honeys going, oh, that's him. Like, yeah, uh, whatever, you know. But, you know, it's just like been there, done that. Yeah. But when I came back. From Hawaii? From Hawaii. Yeah. Junior had left a couple of messages. And it's like, hey, uh, I need to talk to you. Okay. So I went up there and <laughs> I said, what in the hell did you do to yourself? He's got a splint all the way up his left leg. Ah, oh, just pull something. Shit, yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he said, uh, I need to hire you to come back up here and look at that, look after that 12 car. I said, yeah, why is that? He said, well, ain't been going too good. I said, oh, you mean those cars I left up here in 81 that you won with in 82 and in 83 you cut the bodies off of them and built Chevrolets? Oh, that wasn't going too good for you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I told Daryl the same thing. I said, you know, I left you a good fleet of cars up here. You should have won a lot of races, which you did. But, you know, y'all cut the bodies off of them and had some brainstorm. Oh, you're going to go out there and do all this stuff. Oh, that, how'd that work for you anyway? So when I went back up there at the end of 1984, they showed me what they had, and I went, you're kidding, right? You're kidding, right? No way in hell. Anyway, I called Mike Laughlin. I said, hey, dude, I got to have a chassis. He goes, Brewer. I go, Mike. I got to have a chassis. And he goes, okay. So I built Neil Bonnet, a, a nice little old car that, I don't know if you remember it or not, but 1985, I showed up down there. 85 <laughs> or 86? It's 85. I had that flat sided car. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve Mill, I'll never forget when I loaded that car. Steve Mill come over there. He went, hey, Brewer, you unloaded the wrong car. The hell are you talking about? He said, this is the one that races at New Smyrna. <laughs> <laughs> I went, no, 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 no. And Doug Rector, he was working with me at the time, and I told him, I said, you put that car cover on that car every afternoon. You pull the chains down it, and you lock it. Because I don't need nobody over measuring on this car. Now, what? where was this? Daytona Beach. Daytona. Daytona, 1985. That's 85. when Bill Elliott showed up like the gunslinger yeah. from yeah. hell and kicked everybody pretty bad. But anyway, they took the air dam away from us. I was in the wind tunnel and made a pretty good discovery that, you know, when, when the right side of that car was perfectly flat, I'm talking as flat as that door right there. It didn't have no curvature in it at all. You couldn't create lift with a flat-sided car. So when you put that car in y'all, it was it was really good. And we had a couple of little tricks. But anyway, I put about that much back in the air down on the nose. And Joe Gasway, he come over there, finally on a Saturday morning. Doug got there a little bit before I did. And I told him, I said, don't let Joe get next to this damn car with a tape measure. We're going to be in trouble. Joe come over there and says, you got me a little bit, didn't you? What do you mean I got you? He goes, uh... We took those air dams off the Monte Carlos. I said, ain't no air dam on that Monte Carlo. He said, yeah, but it's funny, two inches appeared back in the nose of it towards the ground. I went, really? How many days we've been here? We've been here 10 days. And now you're going to make me fix that nose on that car? I said, you're going to look like a village idiot in front of all these people. He said, you better not bring this damn thing back no more. I said, don't worry, I won't joke. <laughs> We were leading the race with Neil Bonnet with five to go. In 85? In 1985. Yeah. And blew the motor in the trioval and spun out and Bill won the race. Well, you know, that was okay. We come back and still won a couple of races with Bonnet that year, and it was all good. And then I come back the next year, and, you know, we were, like, narrowing the cars up. When I got there in 85, I had a little 58-inch car, and, you know, the body was really good. So, okay, genius, that's Jackie, or Root, saying, hey, genius, how are you going to get us out of this one? I said, oh, don't worry about it. I'll think of something. Well, I built me a little 56-inch Treadwick car, 
And the reason I got the idea, you ever seen a, a funny car leave with them stickers on the back tires and it's real in there and the, all that stuff's yeah. up under the yeah. chassis? Yeah. I went, I think I can do that. And, and I'll never forget, Junior said, what are you doing with them hubs? I said, cutting a quarter inch off here, cut a quarter inch off here. What are you doing at spindle? I said, I cut an eighth inch off here, cut an eighth inch off there. What are you trying to do, brother? I said, I'm gonna get these big old tires and get these dots off of these fenders and get them up under this car. Hadn't they got tread width rules? Nope. I said, just like last year, they didn't have side templates. Now they got side templates, but they ain't got no tread width minimum. So I narrowed all that stuff up, got a little 56 inch car, got an oil pan on it that about as big as that table. <laughs> <laughs> and Harold always told me, he said, bro, if we could put an oil pan on that car and keep all that oil away from that crankshaft and connecting rods, we'd make probably 10 more horsepower. He was right. <laughs> so I built me, a, built me an oil pan, and it yeah. took an act of Congress to get the motor in and out of the car. I'll never forget, Joe Gasway went up under it before we first got there. He said, what do you got, a damn belly pan on the bottom of the motor now, Brewer? <laughs> I said, ain't a belly pan. I said, but it makes a little bit of horsepower. So don't tell everybody you know, Joe. <laughs> anyway, Joe Gasway, he was a riot. He used to get on me all the time about, hey, Brewer, you've been cheating on my bumper a little bit, ain't you? I said, well, if you're a bumper, you fix a damn thing then. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I used to fire, yeah, fire yeah, with yeah, fire. Yeah. But at Daytona, when I rolled in there with that car, didn't wouldn't fit the templates. Old Joe Gasway, I'll never forget it. Me and him and Dick Beatty sitting in the office. And Joe is just giving me down the road right there with Beatty. And he says, Dick, if he runs that car here, I'm going to Atlanta. And I pulled a roll of hundreds out. I said, how much is a one-way ticket back to Atlanta? Get your ass out of here. Baby said, bro, you can't talk to him like that. I said, well, what's he been talking to me like? I said, he tell me, He said, you ain't going to run that race car here. Well, dude, it's the only one. Up. You better get your backup car off. I said, Joe, I didn't bring no backup car. That's Mr. Johnson's race car right there you're talking about now, pal. You know that, don't you? I mean, but. They fought fire with me, and I fire right back at them. I ain't running wow. from no fight, you know. But I mean, what it is is what it is, you know. Now you wound up racing w with Neil. You won races with Neil, yep. And then with Terry Labonte, and then with Jeff Bodine. What were those years like at Junior Johnson and Associates? Terry Labonte and Bill Elliott's two of the nicest race car drivers you'll ever meet in your life. Terry, he don't whine, period. We should have won a lot of races with Terry Labonte. We broke stuff uh, that we didn't normally break. Bristol, we broke a bolt and a steering arm leading a race. <laughs> Come back, put a bigger bolt in it, then we break the steering arm leading a race. Terry Labonte, we're up there, we got 10 sets of Hoosiers, we got 10 sets of Goodyears. Morgan Shepard blew a hoser, bounced off the wall, and I'll never forget, he come down that wall and Terry, I said, Are you okay? He said, yeah, right rear's down. Okay, bring it on in here, we'll put some tires on it. And he come in there and I, I go to change the front tire and Mike Hill comes on the radio and says, Ivan, what Mikey? He says, there ain't nothing to bolt it to. I go back there and look and it took, it took the hub, the axle, the snout, it took everything right off the car. Wow. But I'm telling you, Terry Labonte, we should have won three at Bristol with Terry. And Pocono, uh, it was it was one of those deals. I won with everybody I ever carried up there. Yeah. I mean, Kale Yarborough, Daryl, Tim Richmond, uh, Neil Bonnet, I didn't, I didn't win with him. Should have won a couple with him. Won a couple with Jeff Bodine. But, I mean, I won seven times at Pocono. And... I think that still stands today, but Bodine, when Jeff first came in, <clears throat> he was good, and you know you could go over some of this stuff. And me and him, me and Jeff, we had a couple of run-ins because you know he was he 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 wasn't a team player to me sometimes. You know, what's wrong with you? Somebody tracked my, my motor home. Well, who gives a damn? You know, have them clean it up. You know, it's like we're at Darlington. And 
we run terrible at Atlanta the week before. So I went, okay, we'll fix this thing. What are you going to do? I said, don't worry, I'll fix it. So I, I just raised a deck lid up an inch and a half in the rear and like, you know, cut <laughs> yeah. the quarter pound yeah. loose, raised the body, put a lot of down yeah. force in the rear up. We go to Darlington. Oh, hey, we're back on kill, ready to go. And it's like, okay. And we got beat. Hmm, the hell's going on with this? I don't know what happened. And he's standing there. He's standing there after the race, and I know he's about to fall out. And he did the dumbest thing I ever seen in my life. I need an ice pack. Okay, I told the guy, I said, "Here, give him a couple of ice packs." He take him ice packs and cram them down in a suit. That's okay. After the race, we're standing there, and me and Junior sat there talking to him. I guarantee you he pulled 15 quart ice bags out of his uniform and he's throwing them on the ground. And I'm sitting there looking and I'm looking at Junior and I'm looking and Junior, he ain't, he ain't grasping what's going on. I said, you a little tired? Oh yeah, a little tired. I said, why the hell didn't you just wrap yourself in saran wrap before you got in a damn race car? What are you talking about? I said, you dumb bastard, you're supposed to take them out before you put them in. You ain't supposed to leave 15 of them in your damn driver suit, you damn fool. I mean, how dumb can you be? Yeah, oh, yeah. Darlington, South Carolina, you bacon, said, and you yeah, wrap yeah. yourself up in plastic. Labor Day. Like, yeah, how dumb yeah. can you be? Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, just think. Yeah. When all else fails, just think. But he finally figured out. We wanted to race the fall race at Charlotte with him. Fuel mileage race. Larry yeah. McReynolds, he, he's the wizard that he is. He runs over to the gas pumps and, Brewer's car held 23.7 gallons. <laughs> well, you didn't know that? <laughs> and Bill France, I swear, after the race at Charlotte, he told Beatty, he said, get that car in here right now. Okay. Brewer. Give me the gas line. He said, you better not have 100 feet of gas line in it either. I said, 100 feet of dash 10 gas line holds one gallon of gas. How would you know that? I went, I don't know. Somebody told me. <laughs> 100 feet. I said, yeah, hold one gallon of gas. Long story short, put that fuel cell up here on the counter. Okay. Let me tell you something. I had a whole fleet of race cars at Junior Johnson's. A whole fleet of them. I had one fuel cell. <laughs> One, that I raced. I raced it every week. I changed the numbers on the bladder. It's like one of those deals. Pete Wright worked on the thing for me, and he knew keep everybody to hell. It's like a piece of tin foil. But at the end of the day, everybody got in that race car. I said, "Hey, I got a fuel cell that's a little questionable," and I said, "Ah, it's a little old, but it works pretty good." Okay, bro, I'm in. Okay, not a problem. But when France had Beatty measure that fuel cell, it was 17 by 33 by nine and a quarter. He says, Beatty, is that right? He went, yep. He says, Beatty, looks like you better. It's about time to take that 22 gallon and then measurements out of that rule book because apparently Brewer knows how to beat that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Frank said, well, there's another paragraph you rewrote in a damn rule book. I went, hey, man, you blame me for everything? He said, we started, we had a rule book about like that. He said, now it's about like that. He said, you're the cause of half of it. I Thank went, you. Really? I said, well, how about your genius Gary Nelson and Smokey Eunuch? I said, if I ever write a book, I'm going to make them two guys look like two campfire girls. <laughs> you know, they wrote back the stuff. They did. Yeah, I'm going to write yeah. about the stuff I got away with. There's a difference. <laughs> it's called the caught and the uncaught. But, uh, it was a game. Now, how did you get around it? Worked hard. Oh, Worked come on. Hard. Worked hard. Okay. All right. Always remember, it's all about volume. And the more volume you can put in it, but that's like... I guess Jerry Punch said one time, said, Brewer, he probably fills his car up in June and fills it back up in September or something. You know, <laughs> it's a street car, but it's all about volume. Okay. And any time you can take mass out of the inside, you're going to hold more volume. 
And it's like that fuel cell, everybody says, well, I think I can make it. You never heard me say, I think I can make it. I know I can make it. <laughs> because it's like Ronnie Dawes, he figured my fuel miles yeah. for years. He come back, he goes, Ivan, you ain't going to make it. Go figure it again. Well, you ain't going to make it. Go figure it again. Come back and says, well, you might make it start finish line, but you ain't going to make it back. As long as he makes it start finish line, I don't give a damn if he makes it back or not. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, Rick, that's, that's the way I roll, man. Either you all in or, hey, just forget it. You know, you're just going to be another cat that happened to be here at the racetrack. And, hey, 1981, we won. We sat on the pole four weeks in a row with Daryl Walter. Wilkesboro, Martinsville, Charlotte, and Rockingham. We won four in a row. Come back, did it four in a row again with 1992 with Bill Elliott. It should have been five the Daytona 500. It had been for old brain dead Ernie Irvin and Sterling Marlin playing bumper tag coming come off turn two back <laughs> yeah. there. But I mean, to me, Rick, I never had a job in my life. It was a game, man. Yeah. It was yeah. a game to me.